We've been using the Elaboration Likelihood Model of Persuasion, ELM, uh, kind of as a, a framework for looking at theories. So if we actually use that model or take a look at it, the first precursor to communication is motivated to process, which I've simply said is willingness to process. And the second precursor is ability. In other words, if you're going to want to communicate, people have to be willing and able. Under willing, we looked at benefit to cost theory. We also looked at social judgment theory. Remember that people aren't willing to process information that's outside their zone of tolerance and information that is within that zone of tolerance but not next to their anchor, not at their anchor, causes dissonance that they then have to resolve. Under ability to process, we looked at schema theory. You have to have a schema to start with, to organize and build on, and cognitive load theory. If the information coming in is above your cognitive limit, you're not able to process. Of these, benefit to cost theory, schema theory, cognitive load theory, I consider those the most important. It does not mean you don't have to know the other two theories, but I think that these three are critical. So what I want to focus on today and actually this week is application of those theories, specifically keeping cognitive load low. And that obviously involves cognitive load theory. It clearly involves benefit to cost theory because cognitive load is a cost. It also involves schema theory. When we're communicating, we're trying to create a specific schema in the recipient's mind. Presenting information in a form that matches the way the brain wants it lowers the load. So it's what I want to focus on in this particular part of the unit, which is, well, how, how does the brain want the information? Well, let's see if we can get some insight by looking at expressions we use in our language. If I told you I knew a man that was so tall he was twice the height of everyone around him, you go, wow, that, that sounds pretty tall. If I showed you a picture, you would go, wow, I see what you mean, because you literally can see what I mean. What's interesting is that we tend to use the word I see even when we can't actually see. Some suggestive phrases. You have a teacher trying to explain something to a student. Do you see what I mean? No, I'm just drawing a blank. Well, picture this. Ah, now do you get the picture? Oh, I see what you mean. This could go on without any visual being passed between them. It could go on with just using words. Einstein did what he called thought experiments, uh, imagining what it would like to ride on the back of a light wave, what it would be like to, to be in an elevator that was falling, what his keys would feel like, etc. And he contended that it was only when he could really see what was happening, that he could translate it into the symbol system that we call language. Mozart composed everything in his head. And when he actually had to write it down, it had his wife read to him because it was such a boring thing to do. So he was trying to convert it into a symbol system. What would you say if somebody described the foul smell of a skunk? Well, you might say, wow, I can imagine that sounds pretty bad. What if the person then had you smell it? Well, would you say, oh, I smell what you mean? Mm, not likely. More likely you would say, I see what you mean. Despite the fact that you didn't see anything, it was about a smell. So what does our use of language suggest? When we know something, we can see or sense it. Now I'm using that word broadly because what we're actually doing is we're trying to create a cognitive model. Now, here's another fancy word, exemplar of a schema. Don't panic. So you have a schema, say, about a chair, and a chair has a back, and it's got, you know, something to sit on, and it's got four legs, and that's your, your template. That's what a schema is, like a template. Well, you have all sorts of examples of chairs, a Victorian chair, some other kind of chair, etc. So those are exemplars, and when you communicate, you're trying to create a very specific example of a schema, a cognitive model, which includes everything you know about something. If you've ever baked bread, well, you know what it smells like, you know what it tastes like, you know what it feels like, you know everything about it, you know what it looks like. All those senses or that sensory information is a part of your cognitive model. 
So we use see to mean understand, no matter the sense involved. Why? Excellent question. Let's see if I can answer it. Some possibilities. A, well, maybe we depend on vision more than any other sense. Hmm, interesting. B, we convert all incoming information to visuals. If you said A, kudos. If you said B, eh, thank you for playing. We do not convert all incoming information to visuals, though we certainly try to see what people are talking about. So A, we depend on vision. We gather more information through our vision than any other way. At least this is the prevailing thought. Let me introduce Bailey's model of working memory. Again, don't panic. You don't have to know it. I want to draw your attention to the fact that we have a visual channel for processing information and a verbal channel for processing information. Two channels, okay? Let's look at the role of those channels. The visual channel processes all incoming visual information. The verbal channel processes everything else. We have one entire channel dedicated to visual information. I mean, we depend really heavily on visual information to understand the world around us. Okay, That's why we use see to mean understand, at least why I think we use the word see. So now that we've talked about these channels, let's talk a little bit about words, because we use them a lot when we try to communicate, as I'm doing now. Well, aren't written words visuals? Well, technically, yes, because you gather the information using your vision. Okay, but then we immediately transfer it to the verbal pathway because words are simply symbols. They are not actually what is. They are something that re represents something else. Which brings me to symbolic interactionism. Again, don't panic. I'm not having you read about this particular theory. It's just a couple of things I want you to understand. Symbolic interactionism involves interacting through a shared set of symbols. That's what humans do. We use symbols to interact, to get our meaning about things, about a person. We attach meaning based on symbols. They are agreed upon representations of something else. Words mean what they do by convention, not because of truth. Okay? So there is nothing inherently fluffy or cute about the word cat. It's just that we all use that symbol to mean this particular mammal. Okay, words are a shared symbol system, but it's a symbol system that isn't complete and it's not completely shared, which gives you the potential for distortion when you're trying to use words to communicate. Let's consider the word paraffin. So if you happen to, uh, you know, you, you make jam or jelly in the U.S. and you walk into a store and you say, give me some paraffin, you know, and you put it in the top to seal it, and it's wax. Well, if you walked in, into a store anywhere else in the world and said, I want some paraffin to put into my jam or jelly, they would really be confused because everywhere else in the world, the word paraffin or that symbol, because that's what a word is, means kerosene. Girl Scout Mints. When my wife was very young, a Scottish family moved in next door. Uh, and again, these are people who speak the same language. Girl Scouts came around selling mints. Said, you know, would you like to buy a box of mints for a dollar? Hmm, sounds like a good deal. We'll take a couple of boxes. Were they surprised when they got boxes that kind of looked like this, only a lot older? Because they were expecting mints, M-I-N-C-E, ground meat, to them, these kind of things are biscuits. Again, same object, different symbol. Look at the possibilities for distortion when you use words to communicate. When I need to communicate something or want to communicate something, I first have to see what it is I want to communicate. And then I have to translate that into words, symbols, based on what I think the meaning of those words is. And that's based on my past experience for how those labels are used. That information or those symbols kind of float through the air, come to a recipient who then has to decode those symbols based on what that person believes the symbols mean, which is based on their past experience. 
Look at all the possibilities for distortion. So why is this important? Different interpretation of symbols, and that includes words, facial expressions, body language, etc., major cause of misunderstandings. We've all experienced it. That's why feedback is important. You can't assume that people interpreted your words correctly. It's also why it's important to know your audience. And specifically, one of the things you want to know is what symbols do they use and what do they mean when they use those symbols? A key point, because words are symbols, they must be translated. Higher effort, higher cognitive load. Every time you use a word, an additional word in communication, say on a sign or you know, in a brochure or something of the sort, it increases the perception of load and the actual load because it takes more time. Excuse me. It increases the amount of cost, but if you're adding words, it will increase the load because you have to translate those words. Picture could be worth a thousand words. Well, that's kind of what that phrase means. Desert? Deserted? Ah, you look at the sign, you look at the title, you look at a lizard, a kangaroo rat, a plant, authentic bird droppings, you come to the conclusion that the desert is not deserted. That's the message. Looking at this picture, you know that you can fall through thin crust, you can encounter something that's really hot, and it doesn't look like it's much fun. Well, that's the message. That's in Yellowstone, by the way. Dogs on leash. This is the men's bathroom. All of, in all of these cases, the message is being sent visually. In this one, you may not know exactly the point that they're trying to communicate, but you know that there's something out of balance. Even if you can't give the whole message visually, you can at least identify the topic. So this is about bighorns, about hawks, about monkeys, looks like it's about traders. And what that does is the recipient it allows the recipient to bring up a schema as a starting point. So visuals are absolutely critical. It's a form that the mind wants the information in in order to absorb it. Key points out of this. Understanding requires creating a cognitive model, something that the person can see in their head. Humans have two channels for processing information. One is dedicated entirely to visual information. Visual is the most important to us, to most people. Any sens sensory input will be processed as is. Now, I didn't really say that, but the point is that you don't have to translate it so it's lower cognitive load. Offering information firsthand that can be gathered through the senses, lower cognitive load. We also trust it more, and there's less possibility of distortion. Words or any other symbols have to be translated to understand meaning, which increases the cognitive load, which increases the cost. It also increases the potential for distorted cognitive models, distorted schemas.